Uh, again, we're talking in this third session about building relationships for the gospel. Some of the categories we talked about last night, we're going to repeat this morning, but with maybe some different quotes and a little bit of a different angle. But I want to share with you a video by Rosaria Butterfield. How many of you have heard of Rosaria Butterfield? Okay, she's a little bit more well-known in uh, Christian evangelical circles. She was a feminist professor at Syracuse University uh, in a lesbian relationship and came to faith in Christ. And her story is an amazing story of change and transformation. And she's being interviewed by a guy named Russell Moore. And Russell Moore is the head of the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, which I think is associated with the SBC. And it's just a brief seven-minute interview where she shares a little bit of her story. But again, the reason why I want to share stories like this with you is to give you a good panoramic view of people like us who struggle uh, in this particular way. I was a gay activist, so and I was also a lesbian and a professor. And the reason that I was a gay activist was not because I was angry or upset or um, I, you know, had an ax to grind, but I genuinely believed that the world would be a better place um, with a, a politics of inclusion and acceptance, and, uh, and I felt that sexual diversity was a key part of, of what, what real diversity meant. And, um, you know, I, I, never, I never remember struggling with same-sex attraction. In fact, when, when sometimes, uh, you know, well-meaning Christians say, you know, we want to put a banner out in front of our church and say, you know, please welcome everybody struggling with same-sex attraction, you know, and we're hoping we'll capture people like you used to be, I I'm sort of scratching my, my head. You know, I was a very happy lesbian. I was not struggling with same-sex attraction until I had committed my life to Christ, and then I struggled. <laughs> but prior to that, there was no struggle. Um, I genuinely believed that uh, lesbian sexuality was a, a more moral choice. Uh, I had had a heterosexual past, so I considered myself an informed lesbian, if you will. Um, <laughs> I, sorry, well, wasn't raised in the evangelical church, so I'm not quite... <laughs> I'll probably say other things in the, in the next 10 minutes that might, uh, might cause a flurry. And, you know, and I just, I just really did, did not un, un, understand it. And I remember once uh, speaking at a gay pride march and there was someone who had a, a placard up that said, AIDS is God's curse on homosexuals. And one of my friends quickly made a placard that said, if AIDS is God's curse upon homosexuals, then lesbians must be God's chosen people. And, and I think, you know, I, I say that, I'm not just to be a smart aleck, but I think people don't realize that when you choose to not share the gospel, but instead choose a kind of easy Christian moralism, it is so easy to defeat. Mm. You know, it, it, it both angers and goads and confuses, but it, it also just, it falls apart. Mm -hmm. So how did you come to Christ? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had written an article um, that was published in the Syracuse Post Gazette, and it was on the Promise Keepers. And I don't remember what the Promise Keepers did. I, maybe my favorite parking spot was missing that week, but they came to town, and I was very much on a war against patriarchy, and so I wrote this letter. And, um, and I had just recently co-authored the university's first domestic partnership policy. So, um, you know, so I think I was kind of in the news. And an elder at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church brought my, my, um, my op-ed uh, and put it on Pastor Ken Smith's desk and said, look, we need to shut this woman up. She's trouble. And Ken apparently said, oh, how about if Floyd and I invite her over for dinner? <laughs> um, and I was at the time writing a book on the religious right from a lesbian feminist point of view. And so when, when Ken wrote me a letter and when we subsequently talked on the phone, um, I quite frankly thought, yeah, I'd love to go to dinner at your house. This is like a free research assistant <laughs> for my book because I was a real scholar and I realized that, uh, you know, I, didn't, I couldn't wade through this book without help. And so that really began a very fruitful um, uh, conversation that, that turned into a real friendship. So at my first dinner at Ken's house, he omitted two very important steps in the rule book of how Christians deal with a heathen like me. You know, take notes, right? Number one, he uh, did not share the gospel with me. 
And number two, he did not invite me to church, which made me wonder if I was chopped liver or something. You know, it was a, but one of the things that really did show to me was that uh, Ken was willing to have a kind of long-term friendship with me. He didn't, you know, he wasn't thinking to himself, oh no, you know, what if she gets hit by a car when she leaves this house and I haven't shared the gospel with her? It will be all my fault. You know, mm -hmm. he, was, he was in it for the long haul. And one of the things that he did not do, and if you talk to Ken Smith um, or, uh, you know, read some of the things that, that, that he has written, I mean, he, he will tell you that he, he did not talk to me for a very long time about my sins plural. And he didn't talk to me about my sins, plural, because he knew I had no understanding of sin, principial. And, you know, and, and what I mean by that is I had no idea that Christians believed that original sin distorted everyone. And Ken wasn't going to deal with my sins, plural, until he felt that we had a, a deep enough understanding of these things. Hmm. And so we spent a good bit, bit of time talking through the Bible, talking through life. Um, he, he not only witnessed to me the gospel, but he also witnessed to me what it means to be a good neighbor. And um, I think when someone asked Ken recently, you know, you know, when did you talk to Rosaria about, you know, the big issues there, you know, Ken never presumed that my being a lesbian was my biggest sin. Um, hmm. he, he knew it wasn't, in fact. He knew that unbelief was. Hmm. And, and so, I, you know, his house was a really interesting house to me. Um, the, the gay and lesbian community is a community quite given to hospitality. And I tell people that I use the hospitality gifts that I use today as a pastor's wife in my queer community because that's where I learned that. But I noticed Ken's house was a lot like my house. People would come in and out and the Bibles would be open. And you know, this wasn't like a museum piece, you know, it'd be open, somebody would spill coffee, that's okay. Um, but I was especially struck with Jesus's invitation that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. My yoke was hard and harsh and it was just increasingly so. And at a, at a dinner party that that was a kind of a standard thing. Um, in the gay and lesbian community, it's common that one night of the week, somebody's house is always open so that the community really functions like a community. People know where to gather and talk and things. My night was Thursday night. And at this gathering, my, my transgendered friend cornered me and said, you know, you're changing and this Bible reading is changing you. Hmm. And, and, um, and I said, I said, you know, what if, what if I said, I think we're all in trouble? You know, what if, what if, I, what if I said, I'm, I'm starting to believe that Jesus is real and risen and we're all in trouble? And in 1999, when I did come to Christ, I did not come to Christ because, because I thought it was a good deal. Hmm. Okay, I didn't come to Christ because I thought that, you know, like weighing a car insurance policy, I was hedging my bets. And I didn't come to Christ because I had stopped loving my girlfriend or stopped loving being a lesbian. I came to Christ because of who Christ is. Hmm. And, and I came to Christ because I was, I was convicted that although I had felt sincerely that I was on the side of peace and justice and compassion, that it was indeed Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time. It's a wonderful interview, and I encourage you to watch more of it. She's authored two autobiographies that are in your handout called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, and then she's also written a phenomenal book on biblical hospitality uh, because she says hospitality in many ways was what was uh, the, the, the thing that actually brought her to faith in Christ through Ken and Floyd. And uh, she's right in talking about hospitality as a marker of the lesbian community in particular. My lesbian neighbors uh, that, that we moved in next to were definitely the most hospitable people in our neighborhood, constantly people flowing in and out. Uh, Butterfield later writes in one of her books, she says, here's one of the deepest ways Christians scared me. She says the lesbian community was home and home felt safe and secure. The people that I knew the best and cared about were in that community. And finally, the lesbian community was accepting and welcoming, while the Christian community appeared, and too often is, exclusive, judgmental, scornful, and afraid of diversity. And 
I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for us to hear a critique from somebody from within to say, we always, I think, can grow in what we're for. And I think that that's one of the things that, that all of you here at Fellowship are, are aiming towards, that you want to be known more for what you are for than by what you're against. And I think in so many ways, that's such a helpful stance to have, especially as it relates to this particular issue. Uh, so let's, let's move forward and, again, talk about some of these different principles about how we build relationships. And, again, like I said, some of these might be duplicative from last night, but we'll try to cover them from a different angle. Uh, the first of which is, again, just being careful with your language. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I'll hear people talk about ways that they have been hurt, or ways that they've been teased or bullied uh, by Christians or by well-meaning Christians. Uh, transgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, teens and adolescents experience bullying at enormous rates as opposed to their heteronormative peers uh, using slurs, using uh, pejorative terms, using euphemistic terms to describe gay and lesbian people is, is unacceptable, right? In terms of even what Rosaria talked about, you know, a, a woman holding up a sign talking about how AIDS is God's curse on gay people. Uh, again, that type of language is just not helpful. That type of language does not say, I want to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ. That communicates, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And then also, in being careful with language, I loved what Rosaria said, and we'll talk about, I think, a little bit later, of we don't want to just reduce down our information about that person to just their sexual orientation. Uh, there's a, we have a large university near us in Akron, Canton. It's a large Christian university. And uh, the head football coach uh, used to attend our church. And he would tell me, he would say, Sundays are my least favorite time in the week because he said the only thing that people want to talk to me on Sunday is, hey, did you win the game on Saturday? And he said, every time I come into church on Sunday, he goes, the only way that people relate to me is based off of the fact that I'm a football coach. And every week it is incredibly difficult because and they weren't really a very good team. So more often than not, they were on the losing side. He just said, Sundays can be so hard. Every week it's, well, hey, how'd you guys do? How did it go, coach? And, well, we lost again. And he said, there's a whole lot more to me than just that I'm a head football coach. There's a lot of other things that I enjoy and that I want to participate in. So we have to be really careful in terms of how we interact with people. Uh, again, friendships are best for these conversations, and I think that, uh, that Rosaria did a great job in describing that. And again, in her book, she writes about this. I love what she puts. She says, even though obviously these Christians, and she's talking about Pastor Ken and Floyd. So Pastor Ken was the pastor in her community, and Floyd was his wife. And it's funny because now Rosaria is married to a pastor. Uh, she says, even though obviously these Christians and I were very different, they seemed to know that I wasn't just a blank slate, that I had values and opinions too, and they talked with me in a way that didn't make me feel erased. And later on in her autobiography, as she referenced that Ken broke a cardinal rule of evangelism and that he didn't invite her to go to church, which I thought that was a fun you know, turn of phrase. Typically, we're trying to, what, bring people like, come here to this Salem campus. Uh, she says in the biography, she says, Ken was willing to bring the church to me. Ken was willing to bring the church to me. I thought, that's such a good line. You know, instead of saying, hey, we want to pull you out of your community and you come here, us, on a Sunday morning, Ken was willing to invite me into his home and bring the church to me, show the love of Christ to me. And she later says that one of her observations about Pastor Ken was, she said, I was just struck by how unselfish he was. I was struck by how kind and unselfish he was with his time, his generosity, and his attentiveness. Uh, we also want to listen to people's stories, and again, we, we've talked about that pretty extensively last night, but again, I, I want you to hear as many people's stories as you can. And again, for some of you who have maybe never read a story from somebody who struggles uh, uh, with same-sex attraction or never heard someone like Rosaria, I want to keep these people at the forefront of your mind and your thoughts. And so we're going to watch one final video uh, of a woman named Jackie Hill Perry. Are any of you familiar with Jackie Hill Perry? Uh, Jackie Hill Perry is a, a, is a phenomenal speaker. I've done some events with her, and she has an amazing testimony. She's an African-American former lesbian, and uh, she came to faith in Christ as well and is now married, and she's a Christian rap artist and does a lot of spoken word. And uh, Perry is sharing, she's at a youth conference, and she's sharing her testimony about how God brought her out of uh, her state of unbelief. And so we'll listen to that. She's also written a book that's in your appendix uh, called Gay Girl, Good God uh, that is, especially for teens and adolescents, it's phenomenally well-written and uh, just interpersonally, she's just a really engaging individual. Jackie, we, uh, we got to hear 
a little bit of your story there, uh, but we want to we want to flesh some of that out. Maybe yeah. you can you can tell us uh, tell us about about your life, about your upbringing. Tell us who you were before you met Jesus. Give us a snapshot of your life. I was a hot mess <laughs> before, before I met Jesus. Um, I was raised in a single parent household. Uh, was fatherless for the most part. I knew my dad, but he was really inconsistent in and out of my life. Um, God was faithful and sovereign to allow me to be um, kind of in a community of Christians randomly. Like my aunt was a believer, my mother wasn't. And so I saw how my aunt lived and how I saw her live for a long time really instilled some deep Christian convictions in me pretty early. Um, but around high school, I just did um, what typically everybody did. I smoked weed, I stole a lot, I got drunk. Um, I just did everything <laughs> ratchet. Um, and then around high school, <laughs> I did. Around high school is when um, I had always felt an attraction to women. I remember distinctly feeling an attraction in kindergarten um, to uh, girls and being introduced to pornography and masturbation around six or seven, I think, fueled that. Um, and so around high school is when I actually pursued um, lesbianism and I enjoyed it. It felt natural. It felt like something I should be doing, but in the midst of it, I still didn't have peace. I still didn't have um, joy for the most part. And so I was in that lifestyle for a while, going to gay pride parades, um, gay clubs, wearing rainbow bracelets all over the place, um, just doing everything that my nature uh, led me to do until around October 2008. I was 19, and it was a year after I graduated high school. And um, I was in my bed, like, watching Making a Band or something. I don't know. It was something random. And <laughs> I felt God lead me to see that the sins I was in would kill me. And um, basically like wages of sin equals death. And it was like growing up in the church in a sense, you know that, you hear it all the time, but at that point it was no longer theoretical. It wasn't an idea, it wasn't, oh yeah, for the wages of sin equals death. It was like, no, this is reality and this could happen when you close your eyes tonight. Um, and so I saw that though sin was deserving of death, and that's true in the Bible, so is Jesus being Savior and being able to forgive and heal those who repent and believe in his name. And so if the wages is true, then forgiveness is true too. I simply need to believe it. Um, and so that's what happened. So in, in <laughs> it's like moment, I either die or I live, and I chose yeah. life. So in that moment, you, you gave your life to Jesus. Yeah. What, did, what did that... Uh, I mean, obviously, you're, you're, you're turning your life around. What did that process look, right, look like in the, in the following years? Yeah, it was difficult. It was very difficult because, I mean, you, as a believer, you're, you're trying to walk contrary to everything you know, everything you enjoy, everything you love. But I think what helped me was I was immediately placed into a community of believers that helped me and walked with me. I think if I isolated myself from believers, I wouldn't have been as victorious as I was. You know what I'm saying? I know. That's before I had dreads. Um, <laughs> and so I think getting a community believer, having um, discipleship, I was discipled um, by a woman in my church for like two years where she taught me that, no, Jackie, homosexuality isn't your only issue. You are holistically in need of Jesus. And so let me disciple you in all areas and show you how the gospel should permeate every part of your life. So, yeah. That's kind of awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> well, tell us, uh, obviously, you're a life that's been changed by Jesus, been changed by the gospel. Yeah. What, a, what does your life look like today? Um, I mean, I st I'm still, uh, I'm not ratchet. I still struggle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I still need Jesus daily, but I am, I'm, I've matured and I love him more than I did eight years ago. Um, but God has been faithful to allow me to be married to a great man. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he was patient with me and my, um, my issues. And then on my honeymoon, I got pregnant with my daughter, Eden. Um, and so now... She's a cutie. <laughs> so now my life is learning what it means to be a mother and a wife, as well as to pour into women in my local community and nationally. Awesome. Awesome. Well, your, your story is, is one that uh, is probably familiar to a lot of students here. And uh, I, would, I would say we've got a lot of students uh, who probably know someone that struggles with, with same-sex attraction and someone that maybe they've tried to minister to in the past. Yeah. What would be your advice uh, for people who have a, a friend in their life that, that may have yeah. a similar story? Yeah, I think, I think what's interesting, what I find is that Christians really um, desire methods, which is fine. Um, we want 
strategies and stuff like that, but I think the, the main strategy of the scriptures is the greatest two commandments, which is to love God and love people. Um, how that fleshes itself out is complicated, but I think the more we focus on knowing Jesus and being intimate with him and loving him, then when situations arise, not only are we sensitive to the spirit of God, maybe I should start this conversation. Maybe I should pray for this person. Maybe I should ask this question. We'll also have the boldness coming out of our love for people, out of our love for God to actually say hard things when necessary. Um, and so I think that's what you need to do, love God. Talk to your leaders on what that means. Love people. Talk to your leaders about what that means. Because um, love isn't glossing over truth. That's actually hate. Um, love is being willing to set yourself aside and suffer and offend for the sake of the gospel with compassion. Um, and so I think we need to redefine what love is because culture is trying to, like, switch it. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. Yeah. Now, uh, if we're being honest, there's, there's students, people in this room who, yeah. who struggle with that same thing. Yeah. who've had uh, a similar story to yours, similar upbringing, maybe thoughts like, like you had and have wondered, um, is this something that defines me? Is, yeah. Am I allowed to share this with people? What, what do you want to say to students in this room who have, who have struggled with same-sex attraction and, yeah. and who, have, who have felt like this is something that, that is, is only going on in their life or something that they can't make public? Yeah. Um, what I would say, I have a few things to say, but I have some stuff on YouTube you can watch uh, where I talk about it in detail. But... Um, one is don't allow your temptations to govern your identity. What I mean by that is if you know Jesus, if you love Jesus, you are not what your temptations tell you. You are what God did for you on the cross, which means that you are a friend of God. You are a believer. You are a saint. And out of that should flow an awareness that the promises of God are available to you. So in the midst of your temptations, in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of these inordinate affections, you know that God said, I will help you. I will give you the grace to endure. I am perfect and I am strong in your weakness. Um, I think we have to believe that, but if we are discouraged by how we feel, use it as a means to see that we are human and we are weak, but we have a savior who is strong and we need him daily. Um, and that's my encouragement. Yeah. Well, will you guys help me uh, again thank Jackie for being here, for sharing her heart, for sharing her story. She. Uh, she mentioned she's got some things on YouTube. If you want to look those up, you want to resource yourself, how to minister to friends, how to answer questions, things that are going on in your own life. We appreciate you being here. I think what you hear from, you know, people both like Vaughn and Rosaria and Jackie Hill Perry is the critical importance that a loving church community plays for people like them who struggle in that way. And I'll tell you in counseling that the vast majority of people that I talk to who struggle with same-sex attraction do not feel comfortable uh, in their local churches. Uh, they will say, there's no one else like me at my local church. My leaders uh, would uh, you know, move away from me. They would be isolating. It would not be a safe place. And so in whatever ways we can be a more welcoming community to people who are different than us, uh, I think it would all be at least a good opportunity for us to grow in our love for people like Jackie or like Rosaria. The other thing, too, that I'll just mention as a caveat, because I know some of you probably have someone like Jackie in your life. In her biography, she, or in her autobiography, she writes about her aunt. She even referenced her. You know, her aunt played a critical role, and her aunt would go to church every single Sunday and just would faithfully pray for Jackie every single day uh, that God would save her. And, and sometimes I think we think, well, what can we do? Like, what's available to us for somebody who identifies in that way? And I would always commend to you that we always can be praying. We can always be lifting these people up to the Lord. Uh, next, uh, know the goal of your conversations. Don't be reductionistic in your approach is the next point that I think is on your handout. And what I mean by that, again, is what we've said earlier, is don't reduce a person down to their temptations. And I think Jackie said that so well. Don't reduce a person down to just what they're sexually attracted to. I love what Gregory Cole says in his, uh, he's written a really helpful book about his experience in the church. He says, when you say gay in the church context, many Christians assume you mean the active pursuit of gay sex, probably indiscriminately and with a variety of partners. They envision the most promiscuous edge of the LGBTQ community, the archetype by which the rest of us are measured. At the very least, being gay means that you've adopted a way of life, a set of behaviors, that you are having sex or intend to have sex at some point in the future. And what he's saying there is when you think of somebody who's lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, are you immediately going to the 
mainstream media's representation of that community? Are you thinking of somebody who's maybe really militant, who's really activist in their community? Because uh, those people look, I'd probably say, markedly different than a Rosaria Butterfield or look different than my lesbian neighbors who look very similar to, to just everyday people that we would encounter. And so when we're thinking about how to do ministry, don't be reductionistic in your approach and don't stereotype them in a way that keeps you from getting to know their individual story. Again, we talked last night about not being timid about your beliefs and convictions. Uh, and again, I loved what Jackie said, that love does not mean glossing over the truth. You don't have to sacrifice being truthful about your convictions in order to be compassionate. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, real love informs truth and vice versa. Uh, this is another quote from Tim Keller that I think is helpful for us. He says, love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but keeps us in denial about our flaws, right? This would, be, this would maybe be a mom that would say, oh, you know what, it's not a big deal. We love you. We accept you. You know, let's just not worry about whatever choices you're making. But that's just sentimentality. That's not true love. Truth without love, though, is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. God's saving love in Christ, however, is marked by both radical truthfulness about who we are yet also radical, unconditional commitment to us. The merciful commitment strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves and repent. The conviction and repentance moves us to cling to and rest in God's mercy and grace. Right? We don't want to divorce truth from love or love from truth. Each of those two things, when we make that disconnection, ends up leading to a weakness of each of the constituent elements, not to a better strength, which finds itself in the sum of its parts. A few verses that I think can be helpful to, again, remind us of this is in Philippians 3.20. Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven. And I talked about that last night from 1 Peter 2. But in Philippians 3.20, you know, Paul says, listen, you're not citizens here on earth. You're a citizen of heaven. So you're not supposed to look, smell, sound, talk, believe the same way that the culture does. And in a pressure cooker and in a greenhouse where you feel that you have to affirm whatever everybody's choices are, I want you to remind yourself this morning that you're not a citizen of this earth, that you're a citizen of heaven. Uh, next, give people something positive to say yes to. Uh, Mark Yarhouse says, are we giving people a compelling narrative and script in the life of the church? Uh, does fellowship community, do you guys offer a more compelling narrative to people who struggle with same-sex attraction than what they would get from the LGBT community? Is there a way that people that struggle with same-sex attraction would actually thrive in the community here, at fellowship community, vis-a-vis -vis the LGBT community? Because, friends, that is the message of the gospel. Uh, Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Right? It doesn't say, I have come that you might have life, and it's going to be kind of like on the margins, like it's not really going to be that great. No, in Christ, we can have an abundant life. We can have a life that is both aware of the world that we live in, but still be, as Paul would say, sorrowful but always rejoicing, uh, a dynamic in a world that we can be content in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. Are we painting this picture to strugglers? And again, not just people who are same-sex attracted, but to anybody who's broken. Are we a community of people that says, listen, in Christ, you can have an abundant life? Galatians 5.1, Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Right? If Christianity feels more like a yoke of slavery, then we're probably not doing a good job of communicating the message of the gospel. That being in Christ is actually the most freeing identity because it's an identity that is received and not achieved. Nick Rowan, who I think I've mentioned earlier, he struggles with same-sex attraction but is also married, uh, he wrote this. He says, what the church needs is an alternative script, and it must be a holistic script that accounts for the real emotions and desires of those with SSA. We can't live a life of only saying no to our desires. We need to be able to say yes to something greater, something better. The most basic and the most glorious thing that I have said yes to is Jesus. The joys of following Jesus are everlasting and complete, and they make the temporary promises of sin seem so woefully lacking. However, following Jesus does not make my yearnings for human intimacy and companionship magically disappear, right? What are we giving people, what are we giving people something positive to say yes to 
or are we only giving them prohibitions? Uh, next, uh, we need to be a church that includes and embraces singles, and again, singles who struggle and who are not going to enter into a marriage relationship. If we are going to ask people who suffer with same-sex attraction to reject those longings, not fall into those temptations, then we have to have a very, very strong theology of singleness. And I'll give you just a little bit of background biblically, excuse me, that Scripture actually is unfolding in a pro-single direction. In the Garden of Eden, singleness is non-existent, right? Adam is lonely, and God provides for him Eve, and they're married. If you move forward, in the Old Testament, singleness is highly undesirable, and it's almost uncommon. As soon as you could get married, you got married, you had kids, and that helped further the family bloodline. When you move forward to the New Testament, you actually see that Jesus is not married. He's single and has no children. And so we begin to see maybe that there is a shifting in terms of the overall trajectory of Scripture as it relates to marriage and family. You get to the New Testament later in the epistles, and you see that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that singleness is a what? He describes it as a what? As a gift, as a blessing. So what had been non-existent in the Garden of Eden, we have moved forward in church history to Paul saying it's a gift. And you move to Revelation and to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 19. He says, listen, nobody's going to be given in marriage in heaven. Why? Because the primary way that we will all be relating to each other is this what? Believers in Christ. It says brothers and sisters in Christ. So all of biblical history is actually moving in a pro-single direction. So how are we as a church accounting for that reality? Peter Hubbard writes, he says, single Christians living in purity and community are billboards for the sufficiency of Jesus. And for those of you here today who are single, divorced, widowed, not yet married, but desiring to be married, uh, I want to tell you that you absolutely have a place in the church. Uh, you're not a second-class citizen in the church. Uh, marriage is not the ultimate relationship. If you make marriage into the ultimate relationship, you will ultimately crush it because there's no human being in marriage that can ultimately bear the weight of having all your dreams, hopes, and expectations tied up in their performance or tied up in their personhood. Sam Mulberry writes, he says, if marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, singleness shows us its sufficiency. It's a way of declaring to a world obsessed with sexual and romantic intimacy that these things are not ultimate and that in Christ we possess what is. Right? That is such a countercultural message, and I think that we've communicated that fairly clearly, that culturally, if you're not romantically engaged and sexually active, something is wrong with you. But what we see from Scripture is that is not the ultimate human experience to be, to be marked by or to engage in. Final point, uh, we want to be people who strive for relational credibility. And this is typically what I close with in a setting like this, is that we can leave here today armed with a, not, a lot of information but leave here and actually act in a different way. You might have good information, but leave here the same person. Information without application does not equal transformation. There's a lot of people that have great information, but who don't do good relationships because they've not actually applied the information. And so when we're talking about relational credibility, we need to not just know these things, but we actually need to live them out. Matthew 5.16, Jesus says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What are we seeing from your life? How are you actually bringing glory to the Father through the way that you interact and love other people? John 13, 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It doesn't say this. It doesn't say, By this will all people know that you are my disciples if you have orthodox theology. Right? That's not what it says. And not that, again, that those two things are mutually exclusive or that I'm pitting them against one another, but that what Jesus says is the number one marker of a believer is that you have what? That you have love for one another. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. What I love about Romans 12, 9 is Jesus does not seem to put in juxtaposition loving somebody and hating what is evil. You know, I like how the NIV translates Romans 12, 9, because he says, let your love be without hypocrisy, but also abhor what is evil. You don't have to love somebody and affirm everything about their life and turn a blind eye to their bad choices. You can still be genuine in your love for someone, but still abhor what is evil. 
Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And Paul goes on to say to Timothy, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Right? Our prayers and our thanksgiving should not just be for people who look like you, who talk like you, who are the same gender or race or ethnicity or sexual orientation as you. Paul says, listen, you should be praying for everybody. And he goes on to talk about kings and rulers and people in high positions. But I think the application could also be made to our day and time. Are we praying for our gay neighbors? Are we praying for our gay children? Are we praying for people in our lives who identify as LGBT? And so when we're talking about relational credibility, sometimes I think part of the reason why the church has not done well in this particular arena, especially with people like Jackie or Vaughn or Rosaria, is we're preaching one thing on a Sunday morning, but as our people are leaving the service on Sunday, the way that they are living out what they are taught, that there's a significant discrepancy between that that we're saying on a Sunday morning, this is the good news, this is who Christ is, go and do this, but then we leave here and the life that we live does not actually bear testimony to what our faith calls us to. And so in any ways where we can bridge that gap between our public life and our private life, between our espoused theology and our functional theology, uh, that's an effort that we all want to grow in. I'll just include this slide again like I did last time. Uh, just in terms of if you have other questions or comments uh, or things I can be more clear on, please feel free to follow up with me personally. Uh, We have some time left now at the end, maybe about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. I'll bring Dan back up. And again, any questions you might have or questions really even from last night, if there's a follow-up question about gender, sex, just open it up.